Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today, I'm here with Nathan Agin, who is an actor, a marketer, and an audiobook narrator whose voice cuts right to the chase. He has completed over 40 audiobooks, including titles from HarperCollins, Penguin Random House, and Blackstone Publishing, as well as for indie authors such as Chris Fox and Chuck Wending. He has also narrated 100 or more articles for New York Times bestselling author Mark Manson, who is, of course, known for the subtle art of not giving a bleep. And as an author, he has also self-published and narrated his own book, A Beginner's Meditation Course. He brings 10 plus years of web design, email marketing, and social media experience to his work as an audiobook coach and consultant. Here he is in the flesh, Nathan Agin. Thank you for joining us to answer all of our questions about audiobook marketing and creation. Well, thank you, Carrie. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, yeah, happy to share as much as I can. Well, we are excited. I put your name out to my list on Free Advice Friday, which is my weekly kind of blog where we answer questions. And I opened it up and said, what would you ask if you could ask Nathan anything? And some of the questions that we got were, I mean, expected and some were so insightful. So I just want to go through and ask some of those. But the biggest mm -hmm. one everyone wants to know, is audiobook worth it? What do you think? Um, you know, this, this answer will probably come up a number of times today, but I would say a lot of it depends on your plan and your strategy for your book, uh, depending on what kinds of readers, uh, or listeners you want to reach, uh, what kinds of demographics. Um, but I think overall the numbers are that this is, a hugely growing industry. It's been, I think, double digit growth over the last eight years each year. Um, and so it's just exploding. And as more countries, you know, start listening to English language audiobooks, you know, those numbers are just going to continue to increase. And, um, and then, of course, as uh, translations of other countries' works uh, as they're translated into English, then all of the English speaking re uh, listeners around the world can listen to those books. So, you, you know, I mean, I think on the surface, it is absolutely something to consider um, because and this this may come up again. Right? There are the people that uh, like audio content and then there are the people that need audio content. First group might be people that have long commutes or do, you know, listen to it while they're washing the dishes or doing errands. And then the second group, they might have arthritis. They might have poor eyesight. They might have, uh, you know, um any other issues that would be preventing them from holding a book or reading a Kindle or, or whatever it is. And so those those groups, the, the second group specifically, they would still like to enjoy the content. Uh, and audio is really the best way for them to uh, experience it. So I, I think absolutely, it's definitely something to consider overall in, in your marketing strategy. Yeah, I agree. And I think that as people get busier, as we're commuting more, it's something where people can read without actually having to hold a book or can multitask. So I'm seeing that a lot. My husband, personally, mm -hmm. he drives a lot for work and yep. he will blow through audiobooks because he's in sure. the car for five hours a day. It gives him something to think on. You can only listen to so much radio before it starts to repeat. So no with this idea of audiobook in if it's worth it, are there any genres that you typically think are not a good fit for audiobook? Um, yes. And it's, uh, you know, as narrators get started, sometimes they're just hungry to work and they're just trying to, you know, get things to add to their resume. And very often, uh, very new narrators, you will see a lot of cookbooks in their their uh, beginning years because uh, people are just trying to you know make some money. The, the the rights holders are just trying to make some money, and the narrators are just trying to get experience. Um, but those kinds of books, it it really you know they can be done. There are ways you know there there is kind of a skill to narrating a cookbook, but in general, those aren't great for audio. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is visual, and sometimes you just need to see like okay, what is the list. Of information. Now, again, that doesn't mean that all the people that can't read or, or again, in that second group should be denied the experience of having cookbooks. But I think just depending on what your cookbook looks like, there are some cookbooks that are kind of more narrative. They might tell a story throughout and, and that can lend itself to audio. 
The other thing to consider is if your book has a lot of visuals, um, it's just going to take some time to really think through what is the best way to present that information. I've, I've narrated books where, you know, there's a handful of charts and graphs and I can either describe them or we just pull them out and put them in a PDF that the listener can access and so they can kind of, you know, visually look as they're listening to the book. So there are those kinds of things. I mean, it's it's hard to say, like, you know, that there's any hard and fast rule that, no, you should definitely not have this as an audiobook. You just really want to think through your content and go, what is the experience going to be for the listener? And, you know, is there anything I need to do as the rights holder or publisher to improve that experience or make it as, as best as possible? Sure. That makes a lot of sense. And that brings me to a question about, do you ever see where authors or publishers adapt a book for audiobook, where they're actually making specific changes in the wording in the book itself, so it's more adaptable for audiobook? Very lightly. Um, you know, as a narrator, that's kind of, we have to wear three hats. It's producer, director, and actor. And so depending on the experience level of who we're working with, uh, the rights holder, whether it's publisher or independent, um, you, you know, we may have suggestions of things that, you know what, this works really well in print, but we might want to reduce it here or change it here or reference it here. I mean, the, the big things are like footnotes, you know, and, and things like that, where of course you might see them in a, in a print, but no one's going to listen to an hour worth of footnotes because they just don't care. It's just, it, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, there are those kinds of things, but in terms of the you know, uh, between, you know, the uh, title page and, and about the author, just about everything in there, we will try to narrate as is unless, you know, again, for some reason, there's something really compelling that we need to think about. Every now and then, yes, there are little touches made, but they're more kind of stylistic things uh, rather than broad sweeping changes. Like, you know, we're going to take out chapter four, um, you know, for some, for some reason. Okay, great. So, how, can you walk us through, if someone contacts you and is like, I'd like to do an audiobook, can you walk us through the typical process of what it looks like from someone contacting you through actually finishing and producing that audiobook and just general steps? Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll try, I'll try to keep it to the, uh, you know, the, the five minute answer rather than the 50 minute answer. Um, you, you know, uh, it'll usually first start with, um, you know, them telling me a little bit about the project. I might want to check out, you know, a sample from the book or or the manuscript or whatever, just kind of, you know, uh, see what generally it's about. I may send over a, a five minute sample or something like that, just so they can hear my voice with their words uh, and that kind of thing. And then if that looks good, then we'll move into kind of the production phase where I'll begin to prep the book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction and figure out, you know, terms I need to know or understand or things I need to ask the rights holder um, characters, if, if they're in there, voices and all that kind of stuff, um, so, you know, doing all that prep work. And then I will also submit a, you know, uh, we'll call like a, a checkpoint sample. And uh, ACX has this kind of term like the first 15. And it can be anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes where it's a little bit longer than maybe the initial audition. And it can encompass various parts of the book, you know, really whatever you as the rights holder want to hear to ensure that Yes, this narrator has nailed it. Now, there can be some discussion around that, but you are listening for things like pace and tone and 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 story and characters and all, all these things that are really important for you uh, as the rights holder. That's what you want to hear in that first 15. So again, it could be just one continuous section, could be different snippets from the book. Um, and that's where you really hone in and nail down, yes, this is the style. I'm fortunate to say that you know most of the time, what I turn in, they're just like, great, go for it, you know, just do your thing. Uh, because, you know, there's been a little bit of discussion or they've heard samples of mine or, you know, and then the audition. And so there's there's not too much discussion, but that is really the key point to make sure that, you you know, the rights holder and narrator are on the same page. And I, and I really emphasize that because the kind of standard in our industry is after that first 15, then we go away and record the entire book. Uh, it's not a process where the rights holder or the author is, you know, asking for, you know, daily updates or, you know, chapters wanted to, we'd never get anything done. Uh, just like an author could spend a lifetime editing their own book. Um, if they were involved in the audio and they're like, you know, could you go back and do this sentence with a little bit more energy? And it's like, 
ain't nobody got time for that. It's just, we're not getting paid enough to, to spend that kind of time. Uh, unless an author wants to just, you know, mortgage their house to, you know, fund an audiobook, it just doesn't make sense. And, and really the, the work that a, a rights holder author wants to do up to that point, you know, research the narrator, listen to their samples, listen to what finished quality sounds like, have a conversation, hear what they've submitted. You know, you want to do your due diligence so that after that first 15, you can let go of the project and you feel like I am entrusting a capable, professional, uh, experienced narrator to do their thing. And, and, and that's, you know, the biggest thing is letting go of whatever voice you have in your head, whether it's your own voice or someone else's voice or whatever you wrote it for with a particular actor in mind, you know, that, that narrator may be able to use that for ideas, but they're probably not going to sound exactly like what you have imagined. So that's our process as we go away, we record the entire book. Um, if I'm just kind of independently producing the whole thing and I'm not working with a, a publisher, uh, like a production company, I should say, uh, or a, a, a big publisher, then I will go through all the stages to have the work uh, proofed, meaning someone else listens back to everything to make sure that I actually said what was in the book and nothing sounds weird. There's no extraneous sound, you know, noises in the background. And once we go through all that process, especially if I'm working with an independent, uh, like an independent uh, a producer or author, my responsibility is to deliver retail ready audio. And whether I'm delivering that through ACX or Find Away Voices or some other system, you know, the, the, the expectation is it's ready to go. You can listen to it if you want, but that's my job to, you know, there's kind of an automated process, a human proofer. So it's, it, it has gone undergone some quality control. And then through a lot of these other channels where you're uploading or distributing, they might have their own quality control or, you know, it's a little bit more of an automated faster system, but they're just checking to make sure everything fits within their specs. There are, uh, you know, certainly if the rights holder author hears something, you know, really strange or odd or, or geez, you know, you've mispronounced this world I created and it appears 14 times in the book. Well, then, yes, you, you know, the narrator needs to go back and fix that kind of stuff. Those should be the kinds of questions that are cleared up front. Uh, so that's on the narrator to say, hey, uh, I don't recognize this word in here. Like, did you make this up? And how do, like, how do you pronounce it? So I'll, I will I'll kind of pause there and wait to see if you have any like follow up questions. Yeah. But that's like a very quick uh, general overview of, of production. Yeah. And that's great. And I love what you said as far as like, you have to go and do your thing. I know a lot of authors get so passionate about their projects that they want weekly updates, daily updates. And that's just not, that's not feasible. That means no, no. one gets anything done. And so I think that's a really important point to make. A uh, mm -hmm. question I did have is I'm hearing more and more about proofreading audiobooks with AI. Is that something that you've heard of? How do you feel about that? Um, yeah, no, I have I have no problem with using AI tools and, and I've used them and I, I've worked with a lot of companies that use them. I think that serves as a great first pass. No human is going to be 100% perfect, whether it's me reading the book or even a human listening. So it's good to catch like, you know, because a human might miss a that instead of this, you know, and because your brain can do really funny things, even though you're listening and looking at the words, you think you heard what you want to hear. And so, so, you know, just, yes, the AI tools for um, proofing a book, I think are absolutely helpful. I don't think they replace a human because a human, a human's ears are just, you know, look, if you're putting a book, an audio book out there for just AI to listen to, then sure, just have AI, you know, check it. But, you know, you want humans to listen to this and our ears are just different than what AI can, you know, search for. So it's a great tool for um, a first pass and cleaning up just like little word things here and there. Uh, but, you, you know, even when we do it, you know, you have to go back and kind of review whatever the system flagged because, it may think that this is wrong, but actually, no, it's it's fine or or whatever. You know, it just it's not perfect. So it's a tool. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion in the narrated community about AI in general in terms of AI narrated books. But even with these tools, the tool is only as good as the person using it. So if if you had just a production company, just run the AI and be like, OK, here are all the corrections. It's like, no, they're like now I have to spend time going through. Is this actually a correction or, you know, mm -hmm. so it's. It can create a lot of work down the line. And as narrators, we don't want to uh, suddenly uh, start to take on all this other work that 
becomes expected of us of like, now we need to be reviewing the proofing when that used to be the production company's job. You know, it's just kind of keeping those boundaries clear. Um, but to answer your question, I don't have a problem with those tools. It's just using them the best way possible. Right. Using them as a tool, not as a as a hard stop. And Correct. you kind of alluded to this a little bit as far as working with authors or the, the rights holders. Um, what are your pet peeves or what are things that authors and right holders should avoid doing if they don't want to get on their narrator's bad side? Coming in with the expectation that uh, they are going to be an integral part of the process uh, is is a major red flag or if they're wanting updates regularly. I mean, with some production companies, I do upload chapters or they want chapters updated just so that they can keep their workflow going, but they're not sending that off to the rights holder to listen to. It's they're proofing it, they're editing it. They're, like they're trying to do this in as much as real time as possible. Uh, so that's that's a different discussion. But you know, I think having clear and open communication is great. I mean, I understand it. Production companies, rights holders, you know, they're busy. They probably have a lot going on. There's a lot they're trying to juggle. And so just, you know, it's basic kind of business stuff, just responding in a timely manner of like, if I have questions and I'm waiting on something from you, whether it's a manuscript or how to pronounce something or whatever, it's just like, I want to move forward with this. I want to do this. And if we don't, I might have to bump your project because we might be coming up to other paying work that I've already scheduled in. And I'm not going to move them just because I haven't heard from you in a week. It's like, you know, and, and I'll, I'll try to remind people about that and be as professional as I can. But so I think, you know, that's kind of a general business principle. Anyway, I, I try to respond to people within 24 hours, uh, you know, during the week. Outside of those two things, being able to enjoy and experience what the narrator created versus comparing that to what you have in your head, I think is going to be, is going to serve the author, rights holder, or producer really well, because then we're not going to get into discussions of, oh, I really thought you were going to do this with this character and all that kind of stuff. Like that's, that's all for the first, first 15 checkpoint conversation. But, you know, I, I think as long as those ex expectations in terms of where the involvement is and where it is not, as long as those are clear, um, I don't really have too many pet peeves. Great writing is always welcome, uh, you know, so like that's that's lovely. And I try not to take any project where I'm just like, I know I'm going to hate it. So, you know, that's, you know, that's but that's on me. You know, um, there's a narrator for every book out there. You know, I'm sure there is. So it just might not be me. It might be somebody else. So I'll, I'll stop there. I love it. Is there anything that authors or rights holders can do that actually make your job easier? For example, if I'm writing fantasy and I've got these created worlds and names, is it if I earmark those ahead of time, does that make your life easier? Like, Absolutely. is that the yeah. kind of thing that just really makes an author easier to work with? Yeah. If, if, if there's, I mean, when I come on a project, you know, whether it's a production company or in, like, if there's a list of pronunciations, like already ready for me, like we've gone through the book, we flagged these and even like, here's, cause there are some AI, you know, uh, tools on there, tools online where, you know, you can upload, the author can record different things of like their last name and all the wor worlds they created. So you can hear it from the actual person who wrote it. That's huge. Because if I have to go, if I have to spend time just researching this and, and finding it and figuring it all out. That's, you know, that just lengthens my time on the project and, and delays me getting to actually start recording. So yes, any of that research, any of the things that I need to know uh, going into it are, are huge. I mean, I've had, you know, a 30 plus hour um, medical nonfiction where I, there were so many terms I had to look up and, and double check pronunciation and Fortunately, my wife uh, is a doctor. So every now and then, like I would be running things. I'm like, is this how you say it? You know, and so I had that resource in-house, which was great, but you don't always have that. So um, yeah, that that kind of stuff, anything that's going to help the narrator inhabit the world, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, uh, that's a huge, huge help. Yeah, that's good to know. And I, out of all the books you've narrated, out of all the time you've been narrating, what's the hardest accent for you to do? You know, I would say I narrated a book that my grandfather wrote. Um, he self-published it 41 years ago when that really wasn't a thing. Um, and like, you know, Incredible. typed it out and, you know, just, yeah, I don't know how he, I don't even know how he did it, but he did it. 
Um, and uh, and then it was like 25 years since he he, he had uh, uh, passed away, and 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 kind of as a family project, I, I narrated it and and kind of rediscovered the book. But it takes place up in very northern Alaska, and uh, there's there's kind of a whole host of characters up there. Um, it's a government project that they're working on, but there was a character who was uh, Middle Eastern Arabic, and this was a project that not only uh, personally did I really want to make sure I got it right, um, and there wasn't really like a, a, a rights holder or, or you know anyone else that was going to be saying you, you know Nathan, this is the direction we want to go. I mean, every, everyone else in the family is like, yeah, Nathan, go like go do this. This is your thing. So I had to really wear a lot of hats and stay out of my head as much as possible, which is very difficult uh, in, in, you know, when you're creating and having to wear so many hats. So that was an accent where I think I actually recorded the book and I just didn't feel right about it. I just didn't. It wasn't like it was, um, you know, cartoonish or anything. It just didn't feel grounded. It didn't feel real enough to me. And there's also a fine line of like um, a lot of times people ask about accents and Usually, you just need to give a suggestion. You know, you don't need to go full uh, Lucky Charms uh, leprechaun uh, for people. It's just a little bit of a hint of something is enough to get the listener there and and to distinguish voices. And, and so I just kind of went back and I, and I remember talking uh, to a coach and there was we were talking actually about the tongue, like kind of the thickness of the tongue and how that might affect the accent. And uh, I went back and re-recorded the dialogue for that character, and I felt a lot better about it, and I was happy with what I did. Um, but that was one, you know, I've done a lot of different accents, but that was definitely one that I was just like, okay, this is very different from how Nathan speaks, um, but I don't think it's impossible. I just have to spend a little bit more time figuring it out. Right, just take a little bit longer. And you mentioned a coach. So uh, along with just experience, do you work with the coach? Is that something a lot of audiobook narrators do in their career? Yeah, that's one of the first things, you know, there are Facebook groups where, you know, people are just getting started, like, what do I do? And it's like, get a coach, like, you know, because the coach will be able to tell you what you're doing wrong, stop any bad habits. And I've had the good fortune to work with uh, one coach for nonfiction, uh, Sean Pratt, that also um, has kind of a business track. So you figure out, you know, a lot of branding. And, you know, I came in with some of that experience and knowledge myself, but, you know, packaged with what, how Sean looks at it from a narrator perspective, that was really helpful. Um, and you learn, you know, all the skill sets and techniques in terms of narrating nonfiction and making that uh, material come alive. And then I worked with uh, uh, Shannon Parks, who narrates under uh, Marguerite Gavin, uh, for fiction coaching. And fiction felt a little bit further from me in terms of my comfort zone. So that was really great just to build confidence and experience and, you know, work on different characters and not, you know, figuring out what's going too far, what's not enough and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, coaches are absolutely invaluable and and either whether you're working kind of through a set curriculum or, or over a number of weeks or just dropping in and working with people, I think are really important because it's, it, it's certainly a medium where you need to, I mean, I guess there's any, any field, any creative field, but probably applies to marketing or whatever. If you're not doing it regularly, you can kind of uh, atrophy in terms of just mm -hmm. your, you know, skill set. And you might think like, oh, I'm, you know, it's been six months since I've narrated, I'll be fine. But there, there are just things you pick up and things you learn. And so I think uh, regularly checking in and, and seeing how it's going and, and, um, assessing your abilities and then having somebody else listen to that, uh, I think is really great. There are people that are very professional and have done hundreds of books and still work with coaches or do workshops and things like that. So yeah, absolutely. Very important. Yeah. It sounds like it's a muscle, you know, you have to mm -hmm. kind of make sure that your muscles, <laughs> I like exactly. to think I can avoid the gym for six months and go right back in and start lifting. Then that's what puts me down for a month on my back with, you know, some strained muscles. So exactly. I imagine yeah. it's a bit like that. Uh, yeah. You mentioned that you had a coach for nonfiction and fiction. So like for you as a narrator, how different are those? And do you prefer one over the other? There are just different demands to think of in terms of the material and how to tell the story in each case with fiction there, you know, there's, there's the narrative, there's the characters, there's a sense of pace and, and timing and all this kind of stuff. And, and some of that does apply to nonfiction overall. There's still, 
you know, who are you talking to? What's the audience and, and things like that that you want to keep in mind? Um, but there are definitely techniques with nonfiction to figure out how does this not just sound like, you know, one long paragraph, the entire book sounding like one long paragraph where people's eyes glaze over and they're not, you know, they don't, they're not retaining anything. You know, you, you want it to kind of feel like a presentation or like a Ted talk or something like that, that, that it's, it's that dynamic. It's that interesting. It's that engaging. Um, and, and there's a, you know, of course there's a huge difference. Anybody can just open up a book and hit record on their iPhone and record the book, but that's a lot different from narrating or performing the book. And, and there are definitely, uh, even though a lot of people think acting is easy, you know, on TV or film or whatever, and like, oh, I could do that. It's it it is a skill set, and um, you know, I have a, a theater background and training, but there was still a lot of technique uh, about this work that I needed to learn. Um, in terms of which I enjoy narrating, you know, it kind of comes back to if it's good writing, I I'm I'm all in. Like, I, you know, if it's if it's great you know, suspense thriller, or it's a really interesting, you know, tech book or something like that, then, you know, I mean, cause I, I want to, I want to feel like it's holding my attention while I'm doing it. And if I feel like I'm bored, I'm thinking about anything else that is, I believe subconsciously going to come through my performance that I'm just kind of checked out. And so it takes a lot of energy to really focus on narrating. And so I, you know, I love when the material is challenging or is interesting um, or, you know, is really engaging and, you know, pushes me or pulls me, you know, to really uh, step it up. Yeah. When you, so you mentioned like a good suspense, do you read a chapter like to yourself before you narrate it for recording or are you reading it for the first time when you're recording? So the the advice usually is if if the ending if as a narrator if the ending is a surprise to you you have not done your homework so you you know you definitely want to you know if you get to the end of the chapter and be like wait a second it was the, he was the killer it's like okay hold on there time out we might need to redo this one um, yeah I I definitely prep the books uh, in advance and and you know going through chapter by chapter and and having summaries and character lists and all that kind of stuff so that I know. What's the arc of this story now, like any good, you know, suspense or, or um, things like that, dramatic irony, you know, I, I can't be heavy handed with like, oh, you know, I, I got to make sure like I don't let on that this is the killer in chapter two because we don't find that out until chapter 18. But it's just knowing, OK, this is the person that they're after. And how does that inform what they're doing in this moment? Like, what are they thinking about? What's their what are they going through? So, you know, it's definitely good to have all that information in there, not to mention, you know, accents or regionalisms or anything else that's important to know that we don't find out until chapter 11 that, you know, she has a Southern twang and it's like, oh, I I, I should have known that. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back now. Um, you know, you can't just suddenly introduce that. It reminds me of that uh, Friends episode where Ross suddenly started speaking in a British accent and then he had to kind of phase it out and then it would come back in and it was just like someone's like, what's what's going on with your voice? And he's like, nothing, you know, so. So, yeah, you don't want that uh, experience in an audio book. Yeah, that was a great episode. My siblings and I then did speak an accent for weeks. It was awful. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, it was, it was truly bad. Um, so tell us a little bit about the different types of narration as far as soul, uh, solo, dual, duet. Can you explain those differences to us? Sure. So uh, solo is just one narrator doing the entire book, all the characters. Uh, dual is um and i'm i'd be very curious to see it kind of feels like a chicken and the egg was it did it get really popular as a writing style or did it get really popular as a narration style and which one has kind of you know moved moved the needle forward um we have a lot of books that are written from two perspectives uh and i just did a series like this but sometimes it's a romance where there's a you know male and female character and they're getting together and you have different chapters kind of in each of their voices or perspectives and so you'll have two different narrators usually male identified and female identified uh doing those uh, corresponding chapters the one i did was uh, kind of a mystery suspense so in the it was a four book series over those books i played different characters sometimes i was the one killed sometimes i was the killer you know so it just and and then the other narrator was always the detective everything from her perspective was always uh, in her voice so that's dual 
Now, duet is a little bit more uh, advanced. That is where you're literally splicing dialogue between two narrators. So within a chapter, it can go from one you know narrator one to narrator two, narrator one, narrator two, and it's going back and forth and get back and forth. And so each narrator only records their own lines or their own sections. And then you just need a really talented engineer and editor to be able to put that together. And it's not, you know, anyone can, you know, cut and go into audacity and cut and paste audio, but it's, especially if you have narrators and most of us work from home, uh, being able to just match levels between narrators, uh, making sure it sounds consistent so that the listener isn't like pulled out or one's super loud and one's super, you know, so that's, that's just a little bit more uh, complicated and just, I think has it has a different level of, um, uh, skill required if that's what you're going to do that you know that you make sure you are hiring the right team to put that together um there are also full cast audiobooks which you know um are similar to duet but just you know more people involved so it's more pieces and and more skill required to do all of that and coordinate all of that too so that's a very quick look at those three yeah and i'm seeing dollar signs with the duet and the full cast i think it's probably gets a little point a little bit more pricey as we go along so Absolutely. out of those options though what what's your favorite to do do you have a favorite or do you kind of enjoy both in their own right or all? um i'm you know i've not done a duet um uh yet it, you know i think it's it's the most rare you know duet and full cast because it's just it's it's such a big production I've done multicast books where everyone has their own chapter. Uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of more of the dual format. Y you know, this this is such a um, solitary profession that it's usually just me in these four walls talking into this thing. So any form of collaboration is always welcome. I've recorded a couple of times actually at, you know, recording studios and there's an engineer uh, there and there's a director, you know, patched in. And it's just like, wow, I get to talk to other people while we do this and we get to bounce ideas. And it's it's it, it's kind of like, you know, it reminds a lot of us why we did theater, you know, because there's a social element and then we're all working together on this thing. So that's always fantastic. So, you know, even though dual involves a little more work, maybe coordinating, OK, for these characters, what were you thinking? And just so that, like, you know, the police chief always sounds the same and, you know, he's not squeaky here and then gravelly over here that we want to, you know, you got to coordinate that stuff. But, you know, it's, it's fun to just work with somebody else and, and bounce ideas off another creative individual. Um, and, you know, so that can be a lot of fun. And then, you know, a lot of times you're doing less work, uh, you know, but you still get to be involved in the whole book. So that's always nice. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the, the solo narration, I mean, like that's, you know, that's, that's really where the rubber meets the road. It's like, okay, you know, you gotta, you got a 10 hour book ahead of you. Like you just, you gotta do it. You know, you gotta commit to this and you gotta get it done. Um, the other versions are a little bit easier because there's usually just a little less work involved or a lot less work involved. Um, and, and they can be a little more collaborative. So I, I'm, I'm open to, you know, all of them. They each just bring their kind of different challenges and uh, benefits. Yeah, for sure. And so if someone does have, let's say, a 10-hour book, how long does that typically take you in real time to record? And then also if you're doing any type of production side, like you're delivering for ACX or Find a Way, uh, how long does that take you just so we can fully appreciate the work that goes into that 10 hours of audio? Well, and, you know, like with anything, the the more you do it, usually the faster you get and the better you get because you learn different systems, you figure out techniques. Um, new narrators, they might spend five to six hours for each finished hour that is produced. And so if you have a 10 hour book, you know, that's like a full time almost two weeks of work, you know, uh, and it could be 80 hours, you know, depending on how much is involved prep and all this kind of stuff. And as they're figuring that out. So it's like, okay, for anyone to think about, could you afford, if you had a full-time job to just take two weeks off and only devote all that time to recording and producing this audiobook? Now, of course you can get into like the voice is you can kind of taps out at a certain point, your brain taps out at a certain point, your mouth taps out at a certain point. Uh, so it's not even physically possible to do all of that work at one time. You have to spread it out to some degree. Um, but over time, um, you know, I can usually, depending on the project, get to, you know, two to two and a half hours 
for finished hour. But again, that's because I've been doing this for a number of years. I've done 40 plus audiobooks. Like that had to come over time. Uh, a lot of it is just mm -hmm. confidence in, in what you're doing and, you know, being in the moment and just doing it and trusting the process. Um, but yeah, so I would say, uh, you know, on the high end, it's probably around three hours. Uh, but for my own sake, I try to still deliver as good a performance I can, uh, but try to get that as close to two as I can so that, you know, I'm just moving through as much work uh, as possible. So, so yeah, so for a 10 hour book, you know, that's almost a one full week of work. Right, right. And correct me if I'm wrong, but most narrators are paid per finished hour, correct? So you're actually Absolutely. paid for the delivery hour. So if it takes you two hours or five hours, you're still getting paid the same amount. Correct, which is the other incentive to get better at what you do so that it is not taking you so long. I could see that. I could see that for sure. Yeah. And speaking of payments, how do contracts, can you walk us through some of the contracts and some of the things that authors or rights holders should be aware of or to watch out for when setting up a contract with the narrator? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, so one thing I always tell rights holders to uh look at, especially if they've worked with a, a publisher uh, of any size to get their book out there, is to figure out the audio rights, you know, because that may have been discussed, that may not have been discussed, you know, and so just to figure out where do the audio rights lie? And if it's with the publisher, what are they planning to do? If they're moving ahead with it, great. But, you know, it's figuring out, well, if they don't do anything with it and you want an audio book, well, maybe at a certain point, those audio rights can revert back to you, the rights holder, you, the author. Uh, so it's just figuring out, you know, just having that. I, I think the best thing you do is have that conversation up front. And if they want the audio rights, great. But after a certain time, maybe they come back to you if they haven't done anything. Uh, that just allows you to move forward with your book. I mean, they have many books to deal with that, but uh, you just have, or you have that one uh, in your catalog. In terms of the actual contract. So yes, um, there's, kind of a work for hire, pay for production, which you just mentioned, which is, you know, uh, like any kind of freelance setup that you're paying me to do work. I deliver it. I deliver it. I don't own it. I have no rights to it. It's yours. You've paid me free and clear. No royalties done. Then there is um, a royalty share uh, setup, which you won't find as much with professional narrators um, because in that uh, setup, there's no payment up front and you're only splitting royalties. And I say you don't find that a lot is because um, most authors, if they really have a strong marketing marketing plan or they have a huge following and they're expecting a lot of uh, sales, I think they'd be silly to give up the royalties, you know, just pay the narrator. I mean, like it's a that's a that's a win win. Like if you really believe in your book or you really have the sales to prove it, you shouldn't need to sell me on splitting royalties that it's just yeah, just pay me the money and then you collect all the royalties, uh, you know, um, or, or publisher or whatever. You know, that's that's usually the best deal. Um, the one hybrid that you will find that some uh, professional narrators will take uh, is what they call like, uh, yeah, yeah, the hybrid, the stipend. You know, there's a stipend per finished hour, which is usually less than the narrator's full rate. Uh, plus royalties. So, you know, that might go towards things like, you know, post-production costs or outsourcing other, you know, others that I might take on, whether it's a proofer or, you know, engineer or whatever might need to be done for that project. So those people are getting paid and then I'm taking a risk on the rest and hoping that the royalties will, you know, pay out over the length of that contract. That Those are the three usual ones you'll find. It's just straight pay pay uh, uh pay for production um royalty share uh or the hybrid royalty share like acx very confusingly calls it royalty share plus which a lot of i think people don't understand that it actually means it's plus money that they, they yeah. should have named it they really should have named it something different but they didn't so that's what we have to educate uh authors and, and rights holders on um but yeah those are the three uh, three categories Okay, great. Now, as becoming this kind of trend to narrate your own audiobooks, do you have any advice for when you could consider narrating your own audiobook or when you should look for a professional? Do you have any tips for authors or rights holders for that? It's a lot of work. And so understanding that, and not only is it a lot of uh, 
time to do. It's a lot of mental work. I mean, I get exhausted and I've done a lot of it. Like sometimes I can do a lot of narrating and then I'm just, I'm just kind of spent for the rest of the day. I have to like sit in front of the TV. Like I can't really do anything functional after that. Um, and so just being very aware of the amount of time is going to take. And especially if you've never done this before, the serious amount of time it, it might take you to do this. Um, and, and for most authors, usually your time is going to be better spent writing your next thing or marketing your current thing. Usually. Now, if you have a, a podcasting background or a radio background or an acting background, that helps. It's still a different thing, but that helps. You know, that can, you know, maybe you already have the equipment or you are tapped into some people that might be able to help you produce this. Great. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, unless unless you've done audiobooks before, you're going to want to talk to production companies or coaches or whatever. And there are coaches that work with first time narrators, uh, usually authors as narrators to, you know, give them some ideas. There are also directors out there that can, you know, depending on your budget, be with you, you know, for the audiobook or at least for, you know, sections of it to, you know, to really kind of help you, you know, be as engaging as possible with it. Um, I was just watching a video of uh, Nick Offerman, who, you know, does a lot of audiobook stuff. And um, he he said, I think the question was like, you, you know, what's it like to narrate? And he goes, he goes, grab a book and try to spend just five minutes reading that book aloud. He said, you make so many mistakes. It you don't, it doesn't even occur to you how much, you know, if you're reading in your head, like no big deal, but if you actually have to, you know, perform those words, fiction or nonfiction, and deliver them exactly as written, make them engaging, make them interesting, that's a tough job. And it's not impossible, but it's a tough job. And if it's not in your skill set, uh, it's there's definitely a lot to consider. And especially, you know, you know, like with the house, it's like, yeah, you could probably figure out how to replace your roof, but what is the cost to just hire somebody else to make sure this is going to be done well? I'm I'm never going to have to get on the roof myself and do this. That'll be great. I can do go do other things that I want to do. Um, but it, it's that kind of conversation. And you know, but if you really believe, like for some reason, and there are the exceptions out there. They are not the rule, but the exceptions. Like Neil Gaiman is a great narrator. He's the exception. Uh, I've heard a lot of people hate when Stephen King narrates his own work. So, you know, th there there is definitely it is not a hard and fast rule that if you're a great writer, you're going to be a great narrator. Um, and uh, and so there there I can't tell anyone don't narrate your own book. There's just a lot of things to think about. There's the opportunity cost. There's the real cost. There's the time element. Um, and and just if if this is something you want to do, you know, really, I mean, like at the end of the day, like, do you want to narrate? for hours on end, your own book, or just go, yeah, I'm just going to pay that guy to do it. Great. Done. <laughs> that one, that option. Uh, and I yeah, think that's yeah. really important. And something that you said is that not only do you have to decide if it's right for you or not, but being really honest with yourself, if this is in your skill set. Uh, mm -hmm. Because sometimes I've seen where people, they want it to be in their skill set. And it's not. And I think that if you really want to do this, if it's something that you're passionate about representing your book in the best light, being honest with yourself, if you, if it's your skill set or not, and it may not be. And in that case, uh, there are pros for that. There are pros like Nathan who can help with that. It's the same kind of thing that you would think about with the print or the digital version of your book. Like, yeah, maybe you could put together a cover image, but is that going to represent your book in the best light possible? Um, you know, so it's all those same kinds of conversations. And of course, you know, a bad audiobook uh, is probably not going to get great reviews and might impact sales of your other books. You know, so you, you just, you know, these are these all things they interweave and they're connected. So it, nothing happens in a vacuum. So it, there's just so many things to think through. And, you know, for me, it's kind of a constant evolution of what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses? And can I spend less time on the things that I'm not good at unless I'm just, you know, interested in them and, and I'm doing it as a hobby. But in terms of my work, it's like, yeah, have somebody else do that. Like, I don't, I, I, I need to narrate after that. Just about anybody else can be involved with all the other pieces. I have to narrate, but you know, so it's for you as the you know author, what is it? What are your strengths and what do you need to be doing that nobody else can be doing? Right. I think that was very well put. 
Now, now that we've got an idea of how much time that goes in, all the production pieces, what should an author be looking to pay just ballpark to, mm -hmm. to have an audio book done? Yeah, so I would say the range is going to be anywhere from like $200 to $400 per finished hour. Um, you know, if you're working with uh, uh, professional narrators who are part of SAG-AFTRA, you know, there, there are kind of minimums there. Um, you know, there are uh, situations where I've worked with, uh, you know, certainly production companies where they're handling the post-production. So my narration only cost might be a little bit less. Um, I've worked with uh, independent authors where you know they've they've agreed to be the human proofer, basically listening back to their book. So you know I don't need to outsource that cost, and and that's kind of on them. Like if they don't catch something, that's on them. But they're they're willing to kind of take that time to listen to the book. It's always open for negotiation and discussion to figure out what's going to work for both parties. But I would say that that range two hundred to four hundred thereabouts. Um, is is good for you know uh, professional narrators. Perfect. And is there a way to calculate? My book is x you know x amount of words, so it will probably be this many finished hours. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of it's going to depend, or or there's going to depend on several factors. Uh, the speed of your narrator talking, just what their natural speed is. The uh, material, you know, like is it. Is it really complicated and it needs us to kind of walk, a, you know, walk you through it a little bit more slowly and explain things a little bit more clearly? Uh, or if there's a lot of sections where we just, you know, want to kind of pause and give a little space between things so that, you know, that point lands and then this. Or if there's an action story where the pace is a little bit heightened and all. So there's going to be a lot of factors. So it's 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 not easy to give like an exact figure. But again, there are kind of ballpark numbers that just for easy math, I use the number of around 9,000 uh, to calculate words per hour. So just, again, some easy math. If your book is 45,000 words, that's roughly going to be divided by 9,000 around five hours. Could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less. It's not going to be 10 hours, unlikely, uh, but it's going to be you know plus or minus within that range. Perfect. So then you would take that five hours and you'd multiply that between the per finished hour, which is exactly. 400 to get yeah. your final number. So yeah, if you had a 45,000 word book, ultimately you're looking at, you know, maybe 15, you know, 1500, $1,700, somewhere in there, you know, that, that range Perfect. for a fully, for a fully produced audiobook uh, when you're working with a, a independent narrator producer. Right. Which is fantastic. Now, I know we've kind of kept you for a while, but I'd love to jump in for just a minute. The book is done. It's up. It's produced. What are your just your top three tips for an author or rights holder marketing their audiobook? Absolutely, you know, incorporate samples from the book in your marketing. Um, yes, you can just do static images. Uh, but, you know, there are tools to create what they call audiograms and you can use Canva or uh, Headliner is another tool kind of more was popularized for podcasts, but you can create them there. Um, and, and they combine static images or video, if you want, uh, with audio. And so it's something then because most of the social platforms, you cannot upload audio directly. So you need to create that audiogram, that video with audio. Um, and that's, you know that's going to be great. You know, that's, that is just going to entice people so much more than just, Hey, look at the picture of my book cover. It's, it's out and you know, whatever. But if it's a video, it's going to, and certainly if there's audio too, it's going to engage us. Uh, that's really important. Um, second, I think definitely look at podcasts that you might be able to appear on, you know, start reaching out to shows that are in your genre or, or your niche um, because that is, you are, reaching out to an audience that has already demonstrated they like audio content. They know where to find it. They know how to get it. They're savvy with that technology. And so for them to listen to, you know, just jump over and listen to an audiobook, it is not that big of a stretch. And so if you can go on to the show by yourself or with your narrator or whatever you can arrange, that can be uh, really helpful. And then taking your readers on the journey of producing this um, I think is is really important because, you know, the audiobook release and production deserves as much attention as any of the others. 
And so if you can involve them in, you know, hey, we're casting now, or hey, we just selected this narrator, you know, here's here's a sample from another book they did, you know, just involve them, you know, oh, I'm listening back to the audio now, it sounds great. Involving them in the whole process just kind of primes them that this is coming, this is happening, so that it's not just suddenly a surprise of, oh, there's an audiobook and, you know, you're trying to fit all of your energy into the first two weeks that it's launched, that you've been building that over time, whether it's three months or six months or whatever. Um, you know, there's a lot of pieces that a rights holder will go through uh, to get a produced audiobook. And and then, of course, it never ends. You know, it's a one year later, five years later, nominated for an award, won an award. You know, there's all these different things that you, that you can do. So I, I think taking people on that journey are really uh, is really good. And um, as you as you may have noticed, both, both Carrie and anyone watching, I'm very verbal. So don't don't worry about taking too much of my time. I probably extended this about 35 minutes longer than it needed to be just by talking. But uh, I'm happy to do it. Look, I just got a free pass to ask more questions and I'm not dumb, so I'm going to keep going. Um, well, and you had mentioned on your second point about podcasts, about getting on a podcast with your narrator. Typically, mm -hmm. as a narrator, do you want to be involved in the audiobook marketing? Do you want to be tagged in posts on social media when the announcements are made? How do you as a narrator feel about that? Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I'm happy, you know, because it's, you know, everyone's looking for content. So if I don't have to think of like, oh, what am I going to post on social media this week? You know, it's just, oh, yeah, I can I can share this or reshare this or forward this or whatever. Um, that's great. And, I, and, you know, usually I can't think of a reason why I'd take on a project if I didn't want to be involved. I mean, I guess I could use a, a pseudonym or something like that. But Usually, yeah, I, I'm I'm proud of my work, and and that only helps my business continue to grow and and reach more people. So, um, yeah, no, de very uh, very open to being involved. Um, not every uh, narrator is an extrovert like me. Many of them enjoy just being in this small confined space and not having a lot of people around. So I can't speak to all of them just wanting to do all of your media blitz. Um, but for me, I'm just like, yeah, sure. I'm I'm usually just indoors all day, so I'm happy to you know talk to more people. Right, which is great. And I don't think anyone really is upset about being publicly acknowledged for a job right. well done. Not yes, many of yeah. us are like, man, they said I did a good job. Going to have to remove that tag. So right, I right. think that is always a good idea to acknowledge and thank your mm -hmm. narrator. Um, reviews. Let's get on to reviews because book reviews are hard. Getting reviews for your eBooks, your paperbacks is hard, but getting reviews for an audiobook is painful. So what are your <laughs> tips for not just getting endorsements, but actually getting reviews on sales sites like Audible or iTunes? What are your top tips for getting reviews on your audiobooks? Yes. So there are some companies that, uh, you know, give away free audiobooks in exchange for, uh, you know, reviews and things like that. There's a, a one production company I've worked with, uh, Pink Flamingo Productions, and they've acquired a couple other uh, uh, small pub publishers. And so they do a lot of different genres. But, uh, you know, I'll see a lot of reviews, you know, kind of referencing that they, you know, people got books through them and through their programs. And um, there are email lists where like they'll, you know, put out books and saying who, you know, who wants a code to, you know, claim and listen and you know, uh, listeners are encouraged to write a review and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there are some some things out there. I know, I think the email thing used to be called Audiobook Boom. If you if you Google Audiobook Boom, I can't remember if they changed the name or if it changed to that, but you'll find it, you know, regardless. Um, so that that is definitely one way of going about it. Uh, with ATX and I think with Find A Way, you get these codes, you know, so going out to your list saying, hey, you know, I have three codes that I can give out to listeners, you know, in, uh, in exchange for an honest review, um, things like that. So, you know, I can give people something. And I, I, I don't know where people find the time to listen to all these audiobooks. Maybe it's like your husband, they just have long commutes, but it is amazing how many audiobooks people are going through and, and mm -hmm. burnt and churning through. So uh, there are a lot of people out there who just are, are probably just nonstop listening to audiobooks. So there, there are people who want to hear what you've written, um, and and there are some production companies and other uh, resources of kind of filling that gap. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's exactly like that. Actually, I'm the one who goes, what'd you listen to this week? Let's go leave a review because you would never think of that. Um, and That's very me, nice of you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll see. Uh, because I know working in the industry, I know sure. how much it matters. And a lot of yeah. people don't realize that. It's not that they're, they don't want to leave you a review. They just don't realize how important it is to yeah. the author, to, uh, you know, the rights holder. So I think that is important to go leave reviews. And I love the ideas of using the codes of asking for people. I mean, you can't get what you don't ask for. So simply mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. asking, by making it a contest, you kind of up the value there. And I think that's really smart. Right. Um, another thing that I've seen is that If your book is out and it's wide, meaning that it's available places outside of audio, um, Audible and iTunes, typically through Authors Republic or Find Away Voices, you can apply for a chirp deal. And a chirp deal is essentially the the sister company of BookBub, which is known for discount eBooks. And chirp does discount Mm -hmm. audiobooks. Those are typically priced between free and $4.99. And it goes out for a month. It's actually a month long discount and email on one day. Do you have any experience personally, or do you know um, authors who have used Chirp successfully? Um, I don't have any direct uh, uh, experience. And I I think some of my books are up there, but I I haven't had the conversations with any of the authors or rights holders about it. I mean, you know, I, I think... It's not bad to get your book out there. Um, I wouldn't expect a windfall uh, from a promotion like that. I mean, the three major places people are getting audiobooks are Apple, Audible, and uh, Amazon. And so, you know, it, that's where the lion's share of your sales are going to come from. Um, you know, if you want to make sure your book is available for streaming for libraries or or, or whatever it is, you know, there's definitely a place for that, but the majority of your actual sales are going to come from those three channels. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you can experiment and see, well, how many how many listens did I get or how many sales did I get, whatever. And, you know, maybe it's just something that'll bring in some some trickles of new listeners and they discover your catalog. And it's, you know, it's uh, not totally passive income because you have to set it up and, and do the promotions, but it can just be another small revenue stream that adds to the overall pie of, of what you're creating. Yeah. Um, so I, let me blow your mind, Nathan. So okay. Chirp, let me do it. It's my turn. Uh, so Chirp, if you upload your book through Find Away Voices, it's automatically added to Chirp, which is a sales platform. If you do a Chirp audiobook deal, unlike BookBub, it doesn't currently cost you anything. You have to discount your book and you do take a hit on your royalties so you don't earn full mm-hmm. royalties. But at the moment, because Chirp is still building, it doesn't cost you anything to advertise. And most of the authors I've worked with who have done a Chirp audiobook deal have gotten anywhere between 500 to 2,000 sales in a month. Even wow. for an unknown book. Yeah. And That's crazy. most of them end up with a hundred or more reviews on Chirp after they do an audiobook deal. So I, I have been proven wrong. I, I'm 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 gonna walk out of the booth. That's that's it. That's it for me. No, <laughs> I didn't um, even need to trap you in that question. Uh wow, no, I, I, I I never would have expected that. Because also as a narrator, we look at that and they're like, they're only getting two dollars for that book. Well, thank God I got paid, you know, per finished hour. Like I, you know, I'm 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 happy. Yeah. Well, and when you think about it, when there's no fee, because a book bub deal mm-hmm. can cost a thousand dollars, but when there's no fee, so okay, let's say they're getting two dollars per audiobook, but then they're selling a thousand of them. Well, there's two grand, not too shabby. And what we're seeing a lot of authors do is it's a way to get their audiobook, their narrator out there. So if it's a first in series, then oftentimes you'll see that discount and then people go on to buy the book at full price elsewhere or on Chirp. So I think it's definitely something that was harnessed from BookBub because BookBub already had this huge email list. I think they've harnessed it or else it would never be as successful as it has been. But I think it's something that might become more and more popular over time. I don't know, just my theories. so now you've taught you've taught me something, and maybe I need to start negotiating for back end chirp deals 
uh, with with these uh, rights holders you're going, okay, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a smaller rate up front, but I need a piece of the chirp. So, you know, that, you know, how, how many points are you going to give me over there? There you go. New deals. That's what we're all about. Innovation. Right, right. Uh, now, kind of speaking of this idea of giving your book away, there's this growing trend of releasing audiobooks on YouTube to monetize your YouTube channel. Have you heard of this? Um, I mean, I know there are some audiobooks on YouTube, but I, I'm not super familiar with with putting them there. But I, yeah, I mean, I am I am aware of them. Yeah. Okay. So just so everyone knows that the general idea is that authors are, because you can monetize YouTube, authors are putting up you, their audiobooks, a chapter at a time or an episode at a time, and they're growing their, their subscribers and they are being paid by YouTube for the views to actually get, you know, they're letting people listen to an entire audiobook for free, but they have to do it on YouTube. And some of them are making six figures off of this. Uh, so innovative for sure. But as a narrator, do you have any opinion on that as far as, um, obviously it's free opposed to actually being paid, you know, going through some type of other subscription. Do you think that kind of model can last or do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, if people are making six figures and they've only paid uh, like four figures uh, to get the book produced, that's that's definitely sustainable. You know, those are they're, those are great margins. Um, and, you know, if I've been paid my rate up front, you know, you're welcome to do whatever you want with the book. Um, and and I, I was going to be very careful to, uh, you know, make any guesses about how the, how well this works after the last question. Um <laughs> You know, and, and the only thing I, I was thinking is like, well, it's, you know, there aren't like, at least from the studios, movies and TV shows for free on YouTube for a reason. You can purchase them. They link you to actually buy things. Um, and so, I mean, yes, if you're if you can grow an audience and make the money through advertising sales, you know, uh, more power to you. Uh, I think for most authors that don't have a huge rabid following uh and may not be experts on youtube marketing or seo which is fine you can always learn that stuff you know it could be great for um building your list things like that you know if, if there's an entry-level book or or something that you know yeah you can put out there for free maybe it's a little bit shorter or whatever but it gets people to just discover your work because youtube at the end of the day is a search engine you know people are going there to find things and so if you're tagging your information and titling it and all this kind of stuff um, correctly, they may wind up on, on your channel, uh, on your video. And then that can be a great entry point into just, you know, your email list where you tell them about all your other books or what you have going on. So, I mean, yes, it's 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 very uh, it's very uh, uh, exciting and enticing to see like where people have taken YouTube marketing and how much money they're making. Um, but of course, there's a huge gap between like what most people are doing uh, and, and you know, where most people would be starting. Um, and so I think I think it's just being realistic with that. Um, if you want to go all in on YouTube marketing, uh, you know, I, I can't stop you. And you might. Yeah, you might be making six figures, you know, in a few years or, or less. But um, I think for most people, I think I would just see it as a strategy to building your list and, and getting your name out there and not necessarily giving away your full catalog of work. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So I think this is in some ways a brilliant strategy to build a list. But I always caution with any social media stream that social media can be fantastic. Monetizing social media can be fantastic, but you're on their playground. If right. they don't, if they decide they don't like your book, they decide they want to take your channel down. You don't own those followers. So they if they take it away, you suddenly are back to zero. So I couldn't agree more with it being a way to grow, a way to monetize, but making sure that it's not the platform. This is why I can see where actually putting your books out on ACX, on Findway Voices, on Audible, 
because you own it. And even if they mm -hmm. take your, let's say they take your listing down, you still own the file. You still hopefully are building your list. So I think that monetizing right. in every way possible is brilliant. Great. I mean, if you, if you can earn six figures on YouTube, please come show me how I would love to do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, but also I think it's just making sure that you are setting yourself up for success when YouTube we're seeing this on Twitter now, like Twitter was big and now Twitter is kind on rocky, rocky ground. So I think. And, and, sure and, and yeah. And like you said, they can also change the algorithms at any time. And, you know, uh, it's like, what do I need to do to get anyone to see whatever I post on Facebook? Like what, you know, short of, you know, paying for Facebook ads, which is obviously what they want you to do. It's like, does, is anyone seeing anything that, you know, people are posting on their pages anymore? Like, it just seems impossible to get any traction there. So th that's just an example that, that yes, I mean, these businesses are trying to drive you to buy their product. Um, yeah. And so, again, you're you're beholden to their algorithms and what they what their agenda is. Uh, like you said, that, you know, if it doesn't, you know, conform with their uh, guidelines for whatever reason, or they just want to do things differently, you know, it could totally upend what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, but the, I think the important thing, the main reason why I asked you is you as the narrator are not offended or upset by someone releasing something on YouTube. No, no, I, absolutely not. I mean, like if anything, it's again, just, you know, free marketing, free publicity yeah. for me. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if I got paid, you know, what I wanted for the book, I mean, it's, you know, you, you can do whatever you want with it. You can give it away for the rest of your life if you want. Like that's, that's fine. I'm, 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 I'm okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. But that's when you say, please go ahead and just tag me, make sure you mention my name in there. Yeah. You know, let people know how they can find out of more books I've narrated or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, as far as audiobook marketing, is there anything you've seen people do that is an absolute just like no for you that you wouldn't recommend people do to market their audiobooks? Don't market a bad audiobook. You know, if if it's 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 obvious, but you'd be surprised that there's a lot of bad audiobooks out there. Um and and so I would just, you know, if you're at that point where you've produced an audiobook and it's really bad. And it's just like, okay, well, you just have to decide, all right, am I going to go back and have somebody redo this or, or whatever? Um, but that's, you know, that's representative of, of your work and, and your life's blood and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of sweat equity in there. Um, so, yeah, I would just, I would be very thoughtful about that, the, the entire process so that you are excited to to get it out there. But I'm, I'm just trying to think of like anything where it's like, oh my God, that's, that's horrible. Um you know, it's probably the same things of like, make sure the cover like actually gives a good representation of what the book is. Um, you know, the, in terms of the sample, you know, the, the retail sample that people can listen to, um, you know, try to avoid like any strong language or any explicit material or whatever, you know, you can always build that into the description and, and give people uh, uh, mm -hmm. warnings on that kind of stuff. But, you know, you, a lot of people might be playing this at work or around their kids or whatever. And it's just like, oh, I, I, I guess I have to explain that now to my children uh, or my coworkers. So, you know, that those are kinds of just, you know, little things to consider. Yeah. Um, that actually, that reminds me, I like to listen to audiobooks at the gym. And because I'm archaic, occasionally I do listen to the headphones that actually like connect in to my phone. Sure. Yes, yep. I do that yes. sometimes. Running yep. on the treadmill, listening to a client's book, it pulls out in the middle of a very steamy scene. And so the entire gym got to, got to hear this part. That was fun. Right. Yes. Uh, which brings me to a question. When you're looking for a narrator, if your book does have a lot of violence or sexual content or language, is that something that you should tell a narrator before they take on a job or as a narrator is that something that you kind of put out there on whether you're comfortable or not with that absolutely yeah i mean um you know what they call you know trigger warnings now and things like that that you know um whether it's uh you know uh, non-consensual uh, relationships or things like that um you know anything from kidnapping to child abuse to strong language you, you know i mean I'm not here to police what people write about, but I just may choose that I don't want to spend time with those things or I don't want to 
put that out there or, you, you know, in my voice. Um, but I'm not saying that, you know, it shouldn't be out there. So, yeah, I mean, definitely making, um, you know, narrators aware of that ahead of time, um, you know, how explicit the book might be in terms of violence or sex or anything else. Um, yeah, just just giving people a heads up so that there's no surprises. You know, the, uh, most people don't enjoy like crazy surprises. Uh, and so especially once you've already entered into a contract and it's like, wait a second, what what is this? Um, you, you know, you just want to avoid that. So, um, you know, I think it's good for narrators to kind of have an idea of what you do and do not do. And then uh, if you've written a book like that, then just, you know, it, it's just being <laughs> it's just being considerate. It almost sounds like oh, I'm sorry we have to bring this up that you have to be considerate, but just being considerate that not everybody may be as into what you're into. And that's fine. No judgment, but just making people aware that it exists and then they can choose to without judgment, say not for me, but, you know, good luck or I recommend these authors. I mean, there are genres that I'm just not very into. Um, but there are other narrators that love it and do it all the time. And so it's like, all right, great. More work for them. I'll I'll take the I'll take the boring nonfiction that they don't want to do and I'll I'll do that. I'm happy right. to do it. Yeah. That that big medical book, that's the one. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Have you ever gotten into the situation or kind of from the narrator side, flip it a little bit. As a narrator, if you get into a book that's got certain scenes or things that you really are not okay with what would you do? Like, do you, you're in a contract, but if something does come up, how would you handle that? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's on me at that point. Like if I didn't do my due diligence, um, I mean, depending on where we are, like I can ask to cancel the contract and give the money back or, you know, whatever, if that's, if that's, if I really, um, feel that strongly about it. But, uh, I think, you know, probably to salvage it, um, you know, maybe I would say uh, I'm actually going to use a pseudonym for this book, um, you know, and, and you know, that that shouldn't be a big deal for the rights holder. I mean, look, I, I would love to be the kind of narrator that my name sells a lot of books, but it doesn't yet. And I'm OK with that. Uh, so, you know, yes, some rights holders may be kind of cashing in on like, oh, I have this narrator narrating the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yes, that there are some narrators that People will buy whatever they narrate. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, but for me, at where I'm at, and for most you know working narrators, um, having a pseudonym is not going to be a big deal. It's not going to be a deal breaker for a rights holder. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we're like 80% of the book and I find something, you know, that like I should not expect the rights holder to like just let me walk away with whatever I've been paid up to that point. Like, that's that's on me. That's that's really something that I have to I have to reconcile and figure out how how big of a how big do I want to blow this up? Sure. But again, on the author and the rights holder point, I think, as you said, it's just common courtesy to be like, hey, so, you know, this does get very violent or these things happen. Right. And because you also want to make sure, as you said, if you're not into the book, that's really going to show no matter how good of an actor or an actress you are. Right. So I think it's really important that you do because you want a great relationship with your narrator. You want a good relationship with the author or the rights holder because everyone wants to win and you want everyone to win because that makes for a great working relationship, great, you know, great projects that then can go on and hopefully be long lasting relationships there. Absolutely. I mean, very few uh, successful artistic accomplishments happen because people aren't into it. You know, it's just like, <laughs> yeah, everybody's got to be in it. You want everybody to be really into this. And if somebody's not, it's like, okay, not a fit, not a match, no problem. We'll find somebody else. Right. Yep. Reminds me of that movie. He's just not that into you. So exactly. I think it matters. Uh, as a narrator, what would be your dream author or book to narrate? Hmm. Um, I think some of the, the writing of uh, Mark Twain would be a lot of fun. Um, and, and I, and I, and I only say that, I mean, that was the first thing that came into my head. And if there weren't so much of it already that I wouldn't just be adding to the pile because uh, and of course, it's all in the public domain, so I could. But in terms of uh, um, current books or, or things like that, I mean, I think it would be interesting to see 
what I would have done with like the Millennium uh, uh, trilogy books, you know, the girl with the dragon tattoo and all that kind of stuff. And and I know Simon Vance who who did them, and he's phenomenal and fantastic. Um, and there are some other narrators like Ray Porter who I really love. And you know, if if their versions of the book didn't exist or whatever, I, I think it would just be interesting. Like if somehow I was picked, it's like what would I do with that? You know, what what would I do with those stories? And and just because that's material that really um is is asking a lot of of the performer and it's it's really pulling you to kind of meet it where it's at so um you, you know I, I tend to enjoy books with characters that have you know maybe a snarky sense of humor or, or or dry wit or something like that so you know the more that can kind of come out in the writing um it can be a lot of fun so you know i i can't think of a specific book uh you, you know that give me like another or as soon as we get off the call i'll be like that's the book I should have told Gary. I can't believe I couldn't think of it. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are books, but uh, that's that's what I'll say for now. Those are kind of ones, yeah. I love it. I totally put you on the spot. So good job. I would have been like, oh, um, uh. So I love that. Now, just to kind of follow along on that, for any hopeful narrators, aside from getting a coach, what would you suggest for someone who is just kind of thinking about becoming a narrator? Where do they go? How do they learn more? Narratorsroadmap.com. Um, this woman, uh, she put this site together um, and it it is, you know, what beginning narrators or people interested want to know, like just all the different things, links to different things, videos to watch, you know, like one of my coaches, Sean Pratt, has a video that he did years ago, but it's kind of that Nick Offerman thing of like, take a book, you know, start reading it aloud, stop every time you make a mistake, go back to the beginning of the sentence, do that for like 10 minutes, see if you still enjoy it, you know, like those kinds of like introductory tests. Um, and then, you know, if you're, if, you know, and then it gets into the gear conversation um, and, uh, you know, all those, all, all those different things, coaches and, you know, all, rates and all that stuff. So yeah, that'll, that, um, that'll go. Those are the two main things usually we will see in the Facebook groups for new narrators is go to narratorsroadmap.com and get a coach that like that. You don't really need to know anything after that. Like if you, if you exhaust those two options, you'll be fine. Great. Great. And as far as a narrator, do you recommend that narrators or hopeful narrators make reels kind of like speaker reels with different samples of their work? Yeah, so on our websites, usually you will find um, uh, narrator uh, uh, audiobook samples. You know, they're a little bit different than like uh, commercial demos or animation demos. Usually, you know, those might be a minute long and you'll hear like a few different spots or like, you know, eight to 10 seconds of, you know, different commercials or different voices in one file. For audiobooks, since it's a long form uh, medium, you know, you'll have one track, which is one book, and then another track, which is another book. And so you might highlight different genres you can do, different accents you can do, different characters, different points of persp- uh, points of view. Um, so, so yeah, having those different samples uh, on your book, samples of finished books you've done um, mm-hmm. is great because it just shows that you've actually been working. Um, you know, once you, you, you know, but, but hey, look, we all started with nothing. So yeah, right. just start with the samples, um, you know, get those professional you know get those produced so that they sound really good and again that's where your coach might be able to help you and direct you to like how do you actually make it sound good um and uh you know i've i found generally the narrator community is um you know pretty helpful there are a lot of people that like can be kind of snarky and they forget what it's like to totally start out but in their uh to their point like every week we're getting like another four people going hey i've just start i want to start narrating what do i do and it's like have you searched the group? Have you, you know, like, come on, like meet us here, like try to show us a little, uh, 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 can do spirit. Um, so I think that's where their frustration might be or their snarkiness might be coming from a little bit, but, um, generally it's pretty helpful. Right. Well, and people like to help people who help themselves. So if you say, Correct. Yes. I've searched the entire group and I haven't really found the answer to my question, people are much more willing to help out than if you ask something that literally is discussed every day. Right. But make sure you actually search. If you just write, hey, I searched the group, but I can't. It's like, but my my situation is different. Yeah, everybody's situation is different. I know. Go read what's been written, please. It's probably been answered to some degree. Uh, great advice. Um, I love this. Thank you so much. I do have to ask you one thing, though, and I'm going to put you on the spot again. Okay. 
can you do a Morgan Freeman impression? <laughs> um, <laughs> we I talked about this in the beginning. I know. I would probably end up doing. Um, do Do you know who Zay Frank is on YouTube? He does these uh, true facts videos and they're they're really deep dives on like all these different, you know, subspecies of plants and animals. Like they're really fascinating videos. And I think he kind of started just doing like a mock Morgan Freeman accent. And so now it's like I can probably do a Zay Frank impression of Morgan Freeman, like true facts about you know true facts about the dung beetle. You know, and it, and it just does it that way. So it's it's that that you know, like, you know. So it would be it, it's kind of like a mock Morgan Freeman uh, impression. And this reminds me, uh, there was a show. There was this actor uh, Simon Helberg who was on The Big Bang Theory, but before that he was on this show, um, uh, what Live Studio sixty or something like that. It was like a, a Matthew Perry was in it, yeah. and they needed to do a Nick Cage impression. It was about like some Saturday Night Live kind of show, and they asked Simon, they're like, "Can you do a Nicolas Cage impression?" He goes. I can't do Nicolas Cage, but I can do Ben Stiller doing Nicolas Cage. And they were like, we're putting that in the show. So like that, 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 yeah. and that dialogue ended up in the show and that's what he did. So it's like, I feel like the same thing. Like, I don't know if I could do Morgan Freeman, but I can probably, I could probably get closer to Zay Frank doing Morgan Freeman. But I'm, there's my little plug for true facts. If you, if you do Z E Frank on YouTube, it's a, there's, they're just not only are they fascinating, but they're also really hilarious. So he's, uh, he's really developed and honed his skill. And he had, he's like a, I don't know. He was like a VP at BuzzFeed or something like that. So he has a totally oh. different like background, cool. but just uh, is, you know, has some real skill uh, and and flair for camera work. And he always he always talks about his side. I think he has a fictional sidekick called like Jimmy or something like that. And he's like, no, Jimmy, it's not time for that graphic. What What is that graphic doing in there? You know, and so he just has this like back and forth with this guy who doesn't exist, I'm sure. <laughs> See, that's brilliant. I need one of those. So when I'm like, oh, no, I didn't mean that. That was totally right. their fault. It makes yes. perfect sense. Yes, yes. Oh, well, I love that. Thank you so much for, for being here, for giving us your time. You you gave me more information in this call than I ever expected. Um, just from the whole beginning to end, to production, to the narrator side. So thank you for that. I am so excited to share this with our community on New Shelves. And if people or when people want to get in touch with you, where should they go? They can go on uh, my website is audionathan.com. Uh, so and then there's samples and links to, you know, um, a lot of stuff I've done there. And uh, usually on most of the social platforms uh, at Audio Nathan. Um, and you know, you can search, search for that. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's how they can get in touch. And I, uh, am always happy to hear from rights holders and authors. Um, uh, you know, I understand my voice is not always a perfect match for every book out there. No problem, but I'm happy to, you know, at least hear more about what you have and send a sample and, you know, we can start the conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. You know where to find Nathan. Find him online. Give him a plug for how awesome his interview was. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.